You know, of all of the, uh, recently, um, there have been a series of Marvel movies that have come out. And of all of the Marvel movies, I think there's been like 187 that have come out. I'm not sure the exact number. But of all of them that have come out, I think my favorite series is the Iron Man series. Um, I, I think Iron Man's such a great, uh, great character. Um, kind of lovable, uh, you, you kind of like, you're kind of frustrated with him, you kind of love him, but at the same time, um, he's just a, a great character, and he's got this incredible suit, and you know, he swoops in and saves the day. It's just a great series. And in the story of Iron Man as a comic over the decades, one of the things that's so interesting about him is his origin story. Because his origin story, he was going one way, and then he immediately, like, just something so radically changed. And this has been, this is the cover of the comic uh, when they s first told his origin story uh, of Iron Man. It goes way, way back, several, several decades now. And um, how, how it works out is the uh, person in the Iron Man suit is Tony Starks, and he inherits from his father this large weapons manufacturing company. And it is this huge company. So he inherits this company. He's running it. But he's also inherited from his father, his father's brilliance. So he's an inventor. He's, uh, he's just uh, a genius. But on top of that, he's also inherited all of his father's wealth. And so um, when we first come upon Tony Stark's at his origin story, he is really just spending all of the fame, all of the position, uh, all of the wealth on himself. He is just spending it on partying. He's, he's just enjoying the fame. He's all about himself. He's kind of full of himself. And it's just all about him. And then he has this crazy experience. He gets kidnapped by terrorists. And they capture him. They hold him hostage in a cave. And they've captured him and this other scientist. And they want to use his genius to take these missiles that they've stolen and turn them into these weapons of mass destruction. And while he's been captured, he has been hit with some shrapnel that lodges in his chest and is slowly moving towards his heart. And so while they leave him in this cave with this scientist to, uh, to affect these missiles, they have to figure out how to keep this piece of shrapnel from going to his heart. So they put a magnet on top of his heart until uh, he can create what's called this arc reactor. And they can do this real rudimentary rough surgery type of thing to put it in his chest and keep this shrapnel from going into his heart and killing him. Well, after they build this arc reactor, they realize that this is not only saving his life, but this creates this extraordinary amount of energy and could run in a huge piece of machinery. So they take the metal and the iron from the, these missiles and they craft this suit. It's this bulky, hulking suit of iron that he also fashions these weapons onto. And he goes lumbering out of the cave, takes on all of the terrorists, and eventually finds himself free and winds up all the way back at his home. But when he gets back home, he's changed. What's interesting is his circumstances haven't changed. They're all the same. But he's different in them. And what's different about him is he's had like a heart transformation, both literally and figuratively. And now he's no longer just completely living for himself. He's channeling his resources. He's channeling his life experience, his training, his genius. He's now all channeling it into being someone who helps protect the planet. And he eventually crafts this this uh, high-tech piece of machinery, the Iron Man suit. He joins the Avengers. And of all members of the, the Avengers, he becomes the least likely to end up being someone willing to sacrifice his very life. It's this incredible transformation. Now, I wanted to remind you of Iron Man's origin story because that dramatic encounter he has relates very similarly to a dramatic encounter every person who's a follower of Jesus has. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you're a Christ follower, if you would call yourself a Christian, you've had an encounter then that changes everything. It might not actually change the circumstances of your life, might not change your job, 
might not change your relationships, might not change anything else around your life, but it has completely transformed you from your heart out in the midst of them. And now you're living differently. It moves us from living for ourselves to living for something else. And and here's what I want to share with you. I want to share with you a text that teaches about this encounter. Because you might be here and you might be saying, okay, I hear that, but I'm not sure. I mean, for me, yes, I know Jesus, I love Jesus, but it's kind of like, you know, I mean, I go to church every now and then, and when I'm in trouble, I I shoot up a prayer to Jesus, but I'm kind of doing my thing, living my life, but, you know, he comes in and and, and helps every now and then. But I want you to see what this text says about a, a genuine encounter with Jesus and what that looks like. We're going to go to a text today that is one of the most significant texts, one of the most significant scriptures for us as a church. This series is called Origins, and here's what this is about. We're we're talking about our origin story as a church. As um, some of you know, we are coming around to our 20th anniversary as a church. On September 9th will be our 20th anniversary, and so we're spending this summer walking through our origins. We're talking about the passages, the stories, the moments, the truths that God has sunk into our church and said, this is who I've designed you to be. So maybe you've been here from the beginning. There are people in this room right now that they were there on day one. There are people in this room right now that that this is your first time a part of this church. But if you are a part of this church, then this is now part of your story as well because a church is a family. We're a body. And so I want to share with you this text. I want you to open to Philippians chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 18. As you're opening there, um, I want you to know the context. This is a a passage that is written by a guy named Paul, the famous Apostle Paul. We call it a book. We call Philippians a book, but it's a letter. It's written to the church church of the city Philippi. So it's called Philippians. Let's pick it up in verse 18. Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed but with now with full courage now as always Christ will be honored in my body whether by life or by death you can see there's a weight to this passage we're going to just pause there for a second there's a weight to this I mean he's talking about life and death and he's talking about being delivered and so what's the context here that Paul is is writing out of he, if we rewound a little bit in the, earlier in the chapter, uh, first chapter of Philippians, we'd find out that he's imprisoned, literally in chains, probably in Rome, which means that he's got an iron chain, and it's, it's probably with an iron cuff around probably his ankle, maybe also his arms. And that means that it's a rough, hand-forged piece of iron around his ankle. And so I just want you to go in that moment with him. Like, he's in prison. Why? He didn't do anything wrong. He was preaching the gospel. So he's there in the injustice of his situation. And I just want you to enter into the moment. What would that feel like? That iron cuff around his ankle. That's not comfort fit. How'd that feel after an hour? How about 24 hours later? How raw? Maybe uh, three days later. Agonizing? Agonizing? about a month, two months, three months. He might be chained to a wall in a dungeon, but perhaps it's one way they did it. So he's chained to a wall, he can't move. Like at what point do you start feeling suffocated? Like you just wanna, you just gotta get out of there. These walls are closing in on you. You're just, you're breathing in this dank air. You just need, you know, just a breath of fresh air. See the sky. Or worse, maybe he's chained to a soldier. That's another thing they would do. And so he's, he has to do everything with the soldier's permission. And if it's anything like the historical accounts we've heard of what happens with that, these soldiers were just as unhappy to be chained to the prisoner as the prisoner was. And so these soldiers were often cruel, like turning it into some kind of cruel game. And so there's nothing you could do without the permission of this soldier. I mean, imagine what that must be like. And so you can see why he's asking for deliverance, but, but don't misunderstand the tone 
of this passage, he starts out, yes, I will rejoice. In fact, there's probably no book of the Bible so dripping with joy as the book of Philippians. And that is a mighty promise to you, Christian. It's a promise that is, it's beckoning to you that there is no circumstance that you are not given through the power of the Holy Spirit the capacity to overcome with joy even while you're in the midst of it. And here's what he says. He says, I, I hope that I'll be delivered, but here's where his joy is coming from, that just in this circumstance that I might honor Christ. That's mainly my goal. So that as I'm walking through this, number one goal, I want to honor Christ either by my life or by my death. What does he mean by that? More specifically, uh, let's keep going. Let's pick it up in, in verse 21. For me, for to me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. If I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which shall I choose? I cannot tell. I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ. For that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Some of the most powerful words in there that um, Paul ever wrote, some of the most powerful words in the New Testament. He says this, um, one way or another, I'm going to be delivered. Either they're going to let me out of here, or I'm going to die and, and go to heaven. I mean, one way, I'm, I'm getting out of here. And here's what he says. He says, honestly, I'm a little bit torn. I don't know which I want. He says, uh, he says if, I, if, I, um, if I remain and live, and then he specifies in the flesh. Why, why does he need to specify that? Because either way, he's going to live. He says, if I live in the flesh, he says, then here's what that means. They let me out, and, I, and you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to keep serving you, and I, I want to see you continue to thrive. And, and the other churches, he says, that, that he's had a part of, I want to see you growing in the faith. And so if I live, I'm going to keep working for you. In other words, if I live, I'm going to keep with my number one focus, furthering the kingdom of Jesus Christ. If that's... If, if that's what happens if I live, I'll serve. And he says, and I think that's better for you. And then he actually says, you know, I'm, I'm confident. I'm pretty sure that's what's going to happen. I think I'm going to get let out of here and I'm going to keep preaching and I'm going to keep deepening your faith and, and, and keep preaching around and furthering the kingdom of God. But actually, we, we know historically what happened. He was wrong. He was in jail until he gave up his life. It was taken from him a martyr of one serving to further the kingdom of God. But don't feel bad for Paul for two reasons. One, he was overflowing with joy. And two, what he said is, and the other option, if I die, that's what I want more. That's far better. He says, if it's me talking, that's best case scenario. But you've got to see why he said that. It, what, because it's, it's important. It wasn't escapism. It wasn't like, hey, Philippians, you know all I've gone through. You know that I've been shipwrecked and I've been beaten. And one time they took canes and they, they caned me. And one time they tried to stone me to death. And you know that I've got, from all of these injuries, I, I sustained these, these scars all over my body. You know that my eyesight is really weak. You know that I've got this thorn in my flesh. And so, oh, just to get the relief of all the physical pain. Or just get the relief of all the anxiety I deal with as, as the, the churches that I've started and that I love are being persecuted and, and there's false teachers coming in. I just live with so much anxiety as I labor in prayer. 
And he says, and also just to be free of this flesh. I've got this war of sin inside of me. And sometimes I do the things I don't want to do. And I think the things I don't want to think. And, and I'm trying to turn myself over to Jesus. But there's this war of the sin, the parts of me that I hate. And just to be free, to just escape it all. Oh, one day, that would just be wonderful. That's true, but that's not what he said. It's not escapism. He could have said, man, to depart would be far better because he could have said, have you read what the scripture says about heaven? Can you imagine the beauties? Can you imagine the streets paved with, with gold? Can you imagine the day when we get new bodies and, and he recreates the earth because all we've ever experienced is, is an earth under a curse? Can you imagine what it would be like when God, all his goodness and all his creative power, recreates the earth and there's no sin to taint and curse this earth? I mean, we've only seen, we've had sunrises and sunsets steal our breath, but they're only cursed sunrises. We, we've eaten fruits like, like mangoes and oranges that are bursting with flavor and we've only tasted the cursed versions. We've seen beautiful uh, birds fly through the jungles and fish under the sea and coral reefs and we've, we've now today we've seen exploding nebulas in the sky and, and stars just fill up the sky but it's only the cursed version. Can you imagine walking in the new creation when God sets back, when we're stunned and speechless and God speaks and says it's good? But that's not what he says. He says, he could have said, there's so many that have gone before me that I love and they're there waiting for me. He could have said, my, my friend James, the half-brother of Jesus, has already given his life. I knew him, Paul could have said. I knew him and I just want to see him again. I have brothers and sisters who have gone on before us, he says to the Thessalonians. And he said, I'm, I'm still grieving for them, but I, I have hope that I'll see them again. I just can't wait to see them and, and actually have a relationship with them for the rest of eternity that's not tainted by our sin and our selfishness. It's just a pure, beautiful relationship. I just want to take them in my arms and just know that we will never say goodbye again. And, and I want to see all the other saints that have gone on beforehand. He says, I want to see John the Baptist. I want to meet King David. I want to see Daniel and find out what was it like to stand before Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar with such boldness. I want to see Esther and hear the moment she walked before the king. And I want to hear Ruth and her journey. And I want to see Deborah as she stirred up the armies of Israel and meet Abraham. And I want to see all of these heroes of the faith and stand in their presence and share in the glory of what God did in their story. I can't wait to be with the saints, all those in the great cloud of witnesses who are leaning over, watching us as we run the journey. I can't wait to be one of them. That's not what he said. It's true. No, he said, I want to depart and be with him. I just want to be with Jesus. I just want to run into his arms. I just want to once not engage Jesus through faith, but through my sight and my senses. And here's whisper in my ear, well done, good and faithful servant. I want to see Jesus. And if you know Jesus, there's something in you that deeply resonates and stirs and says, that's what I want. And maybe if you, you know about Jesus, but you don't know Jesus, you say, I... I want to be there. I want to know what's so great. But you say, I don't know. Why is that the most important thing? Why does all the other glories of heaven just fade away with the thought of seeing Jesus? You know, maybe it's like this. I want you to imagine every single time an angel appears to someone in, in the Old Testament or the New Testament, they have to say this first. They have to say, okay, don't freak out. Don't be afraid. Because people, when they see angels, when humans, when we as one of God's creatures see another creature, an angel, who is exceedingly superior to us in power and glory, 
When we see, when we stand before angels, like physically, every time humans cower in fear, Why? Their power is overwhelming. Their glory is overwhelming. The Bible tells stories of angels who can single-handedly wipe out tens of thousands of the mightiest armies of the world easily. They're superior creatures. And when we stand before an angel, it's just we cower. But when angels stand before Jesus, they hide their face. What must it be like to stand before a being who's the center of the known universe, who through whom everything was made and holds it all together, who beings like angels, they only have power because they radiate his power and his glory. What must it be like to stand before the one who has all power of the universe that he wields from his hand? Well, I'll tell you what it's like. John, the, the disciple who knew Jesus personally, was like Jesus' closest friend. He knew what Jesus' laugh sounded like. He knew what it sounded like when Jesus was angry. He knows what it sounds like when Jesus cries. He, he, he knows the very tenor of his voice. He could pick him out from a crowd. But one day he got a glimpse in a vision of what the fully glorified Jesus looks like. And he said, I fell down on my face like I was dead. Why? Because he's standing before the one who's holding his cells together. His face radiates like the sun. You can't even look at his face. And that was the second time John had seen him like that. And he's falling apart before Jesus. Imagine what it's like to feel the gaze of the all-powerful son of man, son of God standing before you. The one who makes angels tremble. And the one that makes humans fall on their faces. The one before whom every knee will one day buckle and bow before him. The great I am. What must it be like to stand before that one and then to see in his blazing eyes that he is for you. He's on your side. He's wrapped around you. He he will not let any, any enemy touch you. He's for you. And then in the fire of his holiness, you feel him penetrating the deepest recesses of who you are. And you realize you are more known by this being than any other being. He sees all of your sins. He sees all of your your mistakes. He sees all that you regret. He sees all that you see as filthy on you. And in his penetrating gaze of holiness, you are shocked to see someone who knows you better than you can even imagine. But he He loves you more than you can fathom. And his holiness washes over you. And you're turning into a being that you don't even recognize one that is robed in his righteousness. And then in his tenderness, he pulls you close to him. And you see up close in his arms, there are the scars that purchased your righteousness and your holiness on his hands and on his feet. And you see the cost of the scars on his body to purchase your salvation. And in the warmth of his embrace, you find the very being your soul was always designed to be with. What could possibly What could possibly compare with that? That leads Paul to say this. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Here's what I want you to see, is that Paul turns from explaining his life calling to live as Christ and to die as gain. And he makes a turn in this voice 
in, in this verse to command. It's a command there. He says, so let your life be worthy of this gospel. City Rev, this is what that means. That means that phrase to live is Christ, to die is gain. That means that that is not simply Paul's motto. It's not just the manifesto of the apostles. It's not just the creed of missionaries. It's not just something that super Christians say. That is the descriptor of anyone who calls Jesus their Savior and Lord. That is the calling over your life and my life. That is the reduction of our very existence. It's very simple. To live, if I live, it's for Jesus. I have a, a singular focus of my life. It's to in any way bring glory to him. It's to further his kingdom and to see more people come to know him. It is that singular focus I will give every breath of this life for Jesus. And if I die, I go to be with him. And that's far greater. That's the calling of your life. If you have an encounter with Jesus, you can't just sprinkle a little more Jesus in your life. Be a little more of the Christian religion. Do a little more church. Do a few more prayers. Do a little more Bible reading. Just be a little more good. That's religion. With Jesus, it's all or nothing because of who he is. City Rev, this is part of our origin story. From my knowledge, the first time this passage was taught here at our church was March of 2006. And at that time, um, Rebecca and I had just been invited to um, step in as the interim um, leaders of the church. The founding pastor had uh, recently resigned and I had done an internship at the church and they asked me, even though I was this uh, young seminary kid, I was in seminary, Rebecca was getting her master's in social work and um, they asked just if I would come and preach on the weekends. And so um, I was thrilled for an opportunity to preach and I had lo loved the church because I had served there before and so they asked, hey, why don't you teach through Philippians? And um, I was excited to do that. I, I love the book of Philippians, and I started preaching through. And I remember the week that I came upon responsible to teach this passage. And I sat in my, um, this room just studying there, and I was in between classes, and just this fire awoke in me. It was just moments I'd felt in what the story he'd done in my life and the story he was birthing in Rebecca and my journey, we were at the time just praying real open-ended surrendering prayers. We were praying through a book called Operation World that did basically, uh, uh, gave prayer requests from every country in the world. And we would just every morning pray through another country saying, God, is this the country you're going to send us to share your faith? Like, where do you want us? We'll go anywhere. And we're starting to, to pray that. And just this fire awoken in me from just that he'd been birthing in me for, through my journey and my life and, and among Rebecca and I too. And I just started writing this sermon and it was just pouring out of me about the intensity of what it means to follow Jesus. You can't halfway follow Jesus. Just, he's not a fraction of your life. He's not a slice of your life. It's, it's all or nothing. And I get done with this sermon and I realize I, I don't know if they want to hear this. This is not a popular view of the Christian faith. Not a lot of people want to say this. Not a lot of people want to surrender everything. And so I, I, I remember just feeling fear and I was scared. And so I, I remember I was just praying, and Rebecca and I were praying together, and I'm just like, Lord, is this what you want me to say? And, and I went to a, a friend of mine who was um, in seminary at the same time taking classes. His name is Dan Gossett. And I said, um, Dan, man, can you pray for me this weekend? Because I'm feeling like what, I, what I'm feeling called to pray. I, I called to preach. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm nervous. And he said, look, I, I will pray, but if God's put this on your heart, then um, be obedient. And so I came down to, to the church and just with this burden and Rebecca was praying and I was praying and I just, I just preached it with everything I had. And a moment happened. 
It was a collection of a small group of people in, in a cafeteria. And it was like a, a chord was struck and it was resonating with this person's life and this person's calling and this person's story. And, and there was a, a silence over the room and there were tears starting to flow down from, on cheeks. And we realized that this is a message for all of us. It's something that's a, it's, it's beginning to shape who we're supposed to be. And from that day forward, a discussion began to happen about what if God is calling Roby and Rebecca to come and lead the church. And that led to me stepping in as the lead pastor. And I share that with you to know this text and this calling of what it means to follow Jesus is baked into our story. It's who we're called to be, to have an idea of following Jesus, an idea of discipleship that realizes it is all or nothing following Jesus. It's surrender everything you have or not at all. And so for, for years, this has been deepening in us. And in 2014, we did a teaching series where we basically looked at all of the places where Jesus says, he just put it down. He threw down the gauntlet and he says, look, if you want to be my follower, if you want to be my disciple, this is what it means. Do you want to be my disciple or not? And so we we're trying to grasp like the original intensity that Jesus spoke with as far as what it meant to just follow after him. And so we, we replaced out the, the English word disciple and just read the original Greek word, mathetes. And we said, this is what we want to be. We want to be a follower, a mathetes of you, Jesus, with all of the intensity, the, the original intention of what you wanted to follow after you, this all or nothing, this count the cost, this take up your cross and follow after me, this uh, renounce all that you have, he says in, in Luke 14, renounce all that you have if you're going to follow up to me, just surrender everything. We want that because we truly want to be your mathetes, your follower, your disciple. We want to be a Christian. And so it became more a piece of who we are. We want to be mathetes. And then in 2016, he saw fit to give us a, a living picture of a true mathetes. Uh, along the way, we, we had gotten to know um, a couple. Um, they were attending Hollywood Community Church uh, interestingly, they're basically our grandmother church, one of the churches that supported us in our infancy, Oasis Church, one of our mother churches. This church, ACC, or HCC, Hollywood Community Church, was their mother church, so Hollywood Community Church is like our grandmother church. And it was a couple that grew up um, that were there. They had gotten discipled. They had come to faith. Their names, um, their names were Mike and Amy Rittering. I think we got a picture of, of Mike and Amy. And um, I, I um, got to know Mike. Mike had run a boat company where he repa repaired boats. And um, just got, Jesus got a hold of him. When Jesus got a hold of Mike, I mean, everything was changed. And he realized he was actually called to, be, um, to, to go into the ministry. So he went and he served at his church and he came, went on staff with his church. And he, then he started praying real dangerous prayers. He said, Jesus, I'll go anywhere. I'll do anything. You want me to go to Africa? I'll go to Africa. You want me to drill wells in Africa? I'll, I'll go drill wells in Africa. And um, then his brother called him, who was in the ministry as well, and said, hey, Mike, I'm going on a mission trip. Uh, you want to come? He's like, oh, that sounds interesting. Where are you going? He says, I'm going to drill wells in Africa. <laughs> Mike said, okay, sure. And he went to Africa, and he came back, and he said he, he left his heart there. He told Amy, I, I think we might be called to go drill wells in Africa. And get this, Amy had never even been on a foreign mission trip. Like never for like a week. But she knew Jesus. And she said, I think you're right. So then they told their teenage daughters. And their 16-year-old Delaney said, I don't know, Dad, I, I just want to finish high school here. And they're like, you know what? If he's not calling all of us, then, then we'll, we'll just keep praying. Two weeks later, this 16-year-old said, I think we're called to go to Africa. So they sold all they had, and they went to Africa. And, and here's the thing about Mike, um, if you knew him. That might sound like, wow, what a great sacrifice. But here's the thing with Mike. You've never met someone with more joy. He was one of the funniest people I knew. He was just, he, he would never, always looking for an opportunity to just razz you and just tease you. He was just so funny. He was always laughing. 
I remember we took a team over there to see him and we're supporting the work and we've ended up as a church drilling wells over there through their ministry and supporting the, the uh, orphanage over there. And I remember um, I got a chance to speak at his home church over there in Burkina and um, the, he was up there introducing all the members of our team and their pastor was translating into the local dialect and uh, Mike would say, oh, and this member's name is this and this and this and then he's like, I want to invite their lead pastor, Roby, up. And um, because of the way that the Burkina Bay dialect worked, the name Roby, Roby was really hard to pronounce, and so the pastor was getting really embarrassed because he tried it like three or four times and just butchered it, and people are feeling really tense, and Mike looked at him and said in front of the entire church, don't worry, it's weird in English too, <laughs> and they all laughed. That's how Mike was. He was just so funny. And so in 2006, we were taking our second mission, trip, mission team over there, and we were landing in the capital of Burkina, Ouagadougou. The team was, we were back, at, back here, and they prepared, and they prayed, and they're going to send medical relief and, and frontline missions uh, uh, work and partnering with churches over there. And as the plane is descending in Ouagadougou at night, there's a flash in the city, an explosion. The plane turns off all its exterior and interior lights, immediately takes back off and lands in another African country overnight. And um, we find out that there had been a, a terrorist attack in Ouagadougou, which previously before had been a very peaceful country. There has always been the, the presence not far away, but it had been previously very peaceful. The team eventually got back into Ouagadougou. We were planning on getting them out as fast as possible, but they were huddled up with all of the, the people from the, the sheltering wings and the orphanage and all the people that uh, Mike and Amy had been laboring with for years and all waiting to hear. And I got news the, the next morning that the team was safe, but uh, they hadn't heard from Mike. And the uh, place where the explosion had happened was a place I had remember sitting with Mike. It's a, a, a little cafe where a lot of Westerners dine. And so Al-Qaeda had blown up a Jeep outside and gone in with automatic weapons and gunned down almost everyone in the restaurant. And we hadn't heard about Mike. And we all realized that's likely the place he sat waiting for our team to arrive. And so we prayed. And our team and the wonderful Burkina Bay people there were just praying for this man that all of us loved. And a little after lunchtime that day, we heard that they had found Mike's body and he had died. Give it his life. And we realized that the purpose of our team going there, we had thought was one thing, but we realized it was there to share in the grief and bring comfort to those who had lost someone they had so deeply loved. We got a picture of someone who lived out what it means to live as Christ. But don't feel bad for Mike. I don't think I knew someone filled with more joy. And when he died, he's now really living. He's happier than he's ever been. We got a, a living picture of someone who's living it out. Actually, we got two living pictures. Because I sat with Amy and I said, Amy, what are you gonna do now? And she says, what do you mean, what am I gonna do? She said, God called me to Burkina Faso. And so she went back and continues to serve her and it's our joy to continue to to fuel the incredible work that she's doing over there in Burkina. See, church, this is, this is who he's called us to be. He's called us to, if we're here living, it's for Jesus. Because if we die, it's gain. We've already gained everything. So we expend ourselves now for the sake of his kingdom. And as we're offering our life, as we say, here, I'll lose my life for you, Jesus, that's when we find it. So take inventory. What's distracting you? What is the other thing you're living for? What's the dream or the goal that you think your life amounts to? 
doesn't it grow strangely dim as you consider standing before the presence of Jesus? Live for him and let nothing else get in the way of that. Let it transform your heart. It may leave all of your circumstances the same, but the difference is you may go back to the same job, but now it's a mission field. You may go back to the same finances, but now they're his for his kingdom. You may go back to the same relationships, but those are opportunities to share Jesus and to serve in them like Jesus. Have that encounter with Jesus where everything changes. Hollywood Community Church, our, our, a church we love, hosted Mike's funeral. And as I sat there in his funeral, um, there's a moment in there that was unlike anything else I've experienced in my life. Pastor Brian Burkholder, a dear brother and friend of mine, he shared uh, as he was preaching and sharing about Mike and the legacy that Mike is leaving lifting and honoring Amy and their, their children. He, he actually went back and showed us the la a clip from the last sermon that Mike preached at HCC. The last sermon that Mike had preached um, before he died. And what Mike said in that sermon stunned us. It could have only been implanted by God so that we did not miss the example that Mike was to us. I want you to see this clip of Mike preaching. Check this out. What could man do? I mean, man could take me away from my girls. Man could take me away from my children in Burkina Faso. Man could pull us out. They could harm us. I mean, where we live is considered the red zone because Al-Qaeda is an hour and a half north of me at the Mali border. What could man do? He could kill me. He could kill my wife. If we lost everything, even our own lives, we've gained everything in heaven. This is something to look forward to. Can you live your life like that? Philippians 1.21 says, for, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. I now get that. I now understand that. And I embrace that. I love that. How cool is our God if he can give us this, that if we die, this is gain. What else do I have to be afraid of? Can I just pray for us? Thank you, Jesus, for who you are in all your splendor and all of your majesty that you see us and you love us and you want us and you've called us and we know that one day you will return and it is our prayer that you will return and you will find a people a church that are steadfast doing everything we can to live a life worthy of the splendor and majesty and glory of your good news. So we surrender. You may do whatever you want to with our lives. For the joy set before us we will endure. Thank you for the calling on our church. As we embrace this calling to be 
all or nothing for you, mathetes, as you originally called us. And you send us in the city that you love where we see your city transformed. If you're here and you say, look, I've sprinkled Jesus in my life. He's been a piece of my life. He's been a slice of my life. I need to give it all to him. Let today be your day of salvation. You're saved not by your your efforts, it's by accepting that who he is. Find salvation today. Is that you? If you want to put your faith in Jesus today, here's what I want you to do. I just want you to just, with no one looking around, I want you to slip your hand up in the air and say, look, that's me. I, I need to... I need to take that step. I need to find my faith in Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Anyone else say, like, that's me today. I need, I need to take that step. I surrender it to him. I've been holding back. I, I need to surrender it to him. Amen. Then let me lead you in this silent prayer. Say, Jesus, thank you. Thank you for saving me. Just repeat this to him silently. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for dying on the cross to pay for my sins. Believe you rose again. I give you this life because you've given me an eternal one. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if just then you prayed that prayer, for those of you online, just take a minute and go to cityrev.org slash faith. We want to send you a Bible. This is too important of a moment to just silently slip by in your life. We want to send you a Bible and celebrate with you. If you're here and that was your prayer, get that connection card, that Get Connected card, and just check the box that says you put your faith in Jesus for the first time. Check that box off, and then just put that in one of the offering boxes, or you can give it directly to us. Just we'll, There'll be some of, some of our leaders in guest services tent. You can give it to them. And we will give you a Bible and celebrate with you. Church, we're going to sing a song back to our Savior, Jesus. And here's what we're going to say. Jesus, we're tired of just this empty religion where we just sprinkle you in our lives. We, you've shaken us up today. And Jesus, we're giving you everything that we've got. We're making space in our life for you to move. We're surrendering all to you, Jesus, our Savior. Would you stand with me as we declare that back to him together?